spin testing shows the spectacular soundness of the prototype. From this design, the manufacturer offers up a dedicated single-seat fighter version, which becomes the F5 Tiger. This low-cost and high-performance aircraft generates many foreign sales, but fails to wow U.S. buyers. Still, the overall U.S. and European markets for fighters provides a windfall for Northrop. The company continues to refine the F-5 for even more maneuverability, extending the area where the forward section of the wing joins the fuselage into a forward straight. In the early 1970s, this sophisticated concept joined some other T-38 legacies, like the two light engines to produce Northrop's next design, the F-17 Cobra. Prototype designation, YF-17. The Cobra is larger than the F-5 and offers other advances like the twin tail concept, which provides increased stability at high angles of attack. Northrop hopes the model's distinct lineage, good design, and company reputation will trounce its rival, General Dynamics. In the high-stakes battle for government contracts, this is all-out war. Though the plane lacks full fly-by-wire capabilities, Northrop hopes for big sales overseas. With that commitment, they can retool their California factory, bringing an end to F-5 production. Northrop also pins its hopes on a lucrative U.S. Air Force contract, if it can beat its arch rival, General Dynamics. In April 1974, the press, dignitaries, and members of the military gather to see the YF-17. Northrop feels confident as it unveils the new fighter. And for good reason. They've created a great plane at a good price and both the U.S. Air Force and NATO allies recently increased their estimation of how many fighters they need. At stake is the biggest peacetime Western fighter deal ever struck. Of course, the people at General Dynamics are thinking the same thoughts about their new YF-16 Fighting Falcon. The contest is settled in a head-to-head -head competition at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Since 1982, more than 1,458 F-18s have been produced for the U.S. Navy and U.S. Marine Corps, and for the armed services in Canada, Australia, Spain, Kuwait, Switzerland, Finland, and Malaysia. In June of 1974, the YF-16 and YF-17 prototypes go head to head, competing for a government contract for a new air combat fighter. A vigorous fly-off pushes each plane to its limit in a test of engineering skill, mechanical prowess, and as it turns out, business savvy. Both aircraft handle superbly. The contest is razor close. But at the end of the day, the U.S. Air Force awards the contract to General Dynamics for its YF-16. One reason is cost. The YF-16's engine, though more expensive, shares components with the earlier F-15, making service skills and spare parts readily available. General Dynamics takes an enormous gamble on the new F-16 Fighting Falcon. Even before the contest, the company has retooled for the new jet, an incredible risk that gives them a winning angle, the promise of fast delivery. As for the YF-17, its air brake reveals a deficiency, nose wheel liftoff speeds are too high, and the takeoff roll is too long. The judges also question the fighter's range. Though a superb jet with excellent lineage, the YF-17 simply can't compete against General Dynamics' winning entry. There's room for only so many fighters, and the F-16 Fighting Falcon scoops the domestic and export markets. 
the YF-17 flies off into history. Just one more design that doesn't quite make it. Fortunately, the U.S. Navy has a different set of parameters. Their old, reliable F-14 Tomcats still do the job, but they do it at high cost. In the meantime, the A-7 Corsair II attack aircraft is nearing the end of its service life. Developed from a dedicated fighter, the A-7 Corsair II has seen considerable action over Vietnam as a dependable strike bomber. But by the 1980s, they begin to wear out. And some of the F-4 Phantoms serving the Marines need economical replacements. Like the Air Force, the Navy starts looking for a cost-effective, versatile fighter jet. And the single-engine F-16 with the lightweight undercarriage isn't it. McDonnell Douglas, which manufactures the F-4, sets out to fill the Navy's needs. It isn't the first time. Since World War II, McDonnell has supplied the Navy, starting with the Phantom I, the Navy's first fighter jet and the first design McDonnell produces. With the Phantom I, McDonnell impresses the Navy with its ability to produce aircraft specifically tailored to the demands of different services. After the Phantom comes the Banshee, the same shape but with a lot more power. Shown here flying in front of the Phantom 1, the Banshee is a success, cementing McDonald's reputation as a world leader in fighter aircraft design. With a quarter century of military service under its belt, McDonnell unveils its crowning achievement, the F-4 Phantom II. The Navy and Air Force snap up more than 5,000 of them, and McDonnell grows prosperous enough to acquire the long-established Douglas Company. In the late 1970s, McDonnell Douglas gets involved in Northrop's languishing F-17 project. They see the airframe's potential and want to bring it back to life by fixing the bugs and honing the design to fit the Navy's demands for fighter and attack planes. Though based on the bones of the old YF-17, the new version needs thousands of modifications. For Navy use, the wings have to fold to fit on a carrier. The plane needs more range, more powerful engines, and a totally upgraded cockpit in a completely redesigned front section. McDonald's St. Louis plant builds the forward section and wings, but the bulk of the fuselage and skin come from Northrop's Hawthorne factory, using the original F-17 construction jigs. Thus, two relative latecomers to the aviation industry, barely in existence before World War II, come together for an extremely ambitious project. As of today, just a single F-18 Hornet costs $57 million. Plane manufacturers McDonnell Douglas and Northrop, once fierce competitors, come together to salvage the fledgling YF-17 project. The result is the F-18 Hornet. But before manufacturing begins, an advanced flight simulator puts the aircraft through its paces, accurately predicting its performance and suggesting tweaks to the design. The F-17, redesignated the F-18 and renamed the Hornet, moves ahead to the prototype stage. Naval officers and McDonnell engineers study a wooden mock-up of the first F-18 Hornet. The model illustrates what naval crews might expect of the real thing before expensive fabrication begins. 
As a bonus, the YF-17 prototype gives pilots a sense of what the F-18 might feel like, only with a lot less power. But the new F-18 still hasn't hit the St. Louis production line. The Navy insists on one structural change, a more robust undercarriage to absorb the shock of hard landings and abrupt stops on a moving carrier deck. Despite all of McDonald's modifications, the F-18 retains Northrop's basic Cobra design. The F-18 is a derivative of the YF-17 design, but materializes as a bigger and more capable aircraft. That's no coincidence. Heights, wires, and joints from California align perfectly with their partners produced in Missouri. The result is a superb fighter aircraft that fills at least two Navy needs, fighter and attack plane. Declaring all systems go, the first of 20 pre-production F-18s roll out of the McDonnell Douglas production plant to face the toughest test of all. At the end of its debut performance, the Hornet lowers its heavy-duty gear for a graceful landing. Before any fighter goes into service, the pre-production models get pushed to their limits and beyond. Each one of the 20 pre-production aircraft has to pass a specific test before the actual Hornet gets to fly. Some get tested for high-speed maneuverability. Others for weapons carrying and release. And another will face the grueling spin test simulating a total loss of control. Here the Hornet performs beautifully, quickly coming out of the spin and regaining control. An onboard computer tackles disorienting situations and sets the pilot straight. Simulated catapult takeoffs and high angle of descent landings put the prototype F-18s through their paces. In heavy crosswinds, the computer control struggles to keep tons of high-tech equipment traveling in a straight line. On November 3rd, 1979, the F-18 finishes its sea trials after 32 successful takeoffs and landings from the carrier USS America. The F-18 Hornet needs only about 2,000 feet of runway for takeoff in its normal combat configuration without external tanks.
After a battery of tests on land, the new F-18 Hornet must be put through its paces on a real carrier deck. On the 30th of October, 1979, Lieutenant Commander Dick Richards makes the first F-18 carrier landings. Prototype number three gets subjected to continual testing at sea, performing constant touch and goes. Finally, the ultimate challenge, a carrier landing at night, a test of the pilot as well as the plane. The prototype F-18 torture testing tells the Navy what to expect from its new, economical, high-performance aircraft. In the F-18, McDonald's clear understanding of the Navy's requirements and Northrop's brilliant YF-17 design have come together to produce a sophisticated fighter without compromise. After prototype testing, the Navy scraps plans to build separate attack and fighter F-18s. The single, versatile design will do it all. By November 1980, the Navy takes delivery of the first fully operational airframe, now the newly designated F-A-18. With great fanfare, the Hornet goes into commission. It's a proud day for the first squadron to receive the F-A-18, and a proud day for the entire Navy. Two-seat versions of the F-A-18 help crews get familiar with the plane destined to become one of the most important aircraft in Western defense.